Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Um, I'm going to click over so I can see the comments, so I can see what y'all are saying today. Uh, welcome to the November 23rd episode of Pub Talk Live, the live publishing talk show airing the second and fourth Saturday of every month at 9 p.m. Eastern. I'm your host, Sarah Nicholas. I'm a young adult author, I'm a library event planner, and I'm the current managing director of Pitch Wars. Um, just a reminder, you can subscribe on YouTube, but you can also subscribe to Reminders via email by clicking on the link in the description so that you don't miss a show. Hello, Kelly. Kelly is with us. <laughs> um, you can also follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Pub Talk Live. If you'd like to support the show, you can find a link to the Patreon near the end of the video description down below. And I am going to go ahead and bring on today's guest co-host. So if you saw the end of last episode's video, you saw that we were supposed to have Steph Post and Alex Segura on the show today, but they have both had to cancel um, just like a day or two after the last episode. And so we were able to find people to um, come on the show today anyway, and we have some pretty great people on the show today. So uh, you're not going to be missing out on anything because we still have some wonderful people. Um, so my go guest co-host for today is Kelly Peterson. Kelly Peterson is a Westchester University graduate with a BS Ed in English and Literature. She worked as a junior literary agent for two years before moving to Reese Literary Agency, continuing to champion her authors and the manuscripts she loves. Kelly seeks manuscripts in various genres within middle grade, young adult, and adult age ranges. So everyone, please welcome to the show, Kelly. Hi. Hi, everyone. How are you? <laughs> now some people saying hi. Jennifer is waving. Ebony, oh I think God. Ebony's been watching every episode. So hey, Ebony, thank you so much for continuing to watch the show. Mm -hmm. um, we have, just as a reminder, the viewer poll and so the poll today is, uh, do you consider yourself a plotter, pantser, or somewhere in between? So you can go over to my Twitter, and in the next 27 minutes, you'll be able to vote there. Um, and we will discuss it at the end of the show. Oh, and all right. I think, I think we're ready for news, right? Are we? Are we really, though? <laughs> I'm ready for some of it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, some scandalous news this couple of weeks. It'll be this fun. has been this has been a, um, a two weeks in publishing for sure. Yeah, <laughs> I think we're all feeling it in all. <laughs> um, so the first bit of news is actually not a lot of news at all. Uh, just an update on the Audible captions legal battle, which we've been talking about for months now. Um, basically, the news is that there is no news. Both parties are still considering secret, secret proposals that we don't know what they're talking about. Um, but now they're saying we should expect to hear something on December 3rd. We were supposed to hear something this week, um, but now they've pushed it to December 3rd. So we'll see. And if you don't know what that is, by the way, um, there will be a link down below. But basically, Audible decided they were going to caption uh, audiobooks, thereby creating essentially an ebook, and so publishers were not happy with that. <laughs> yeah, I can see how that would not be a happy thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, in other scandalous news, um, <laughs> the Sarah Dessen thing. Yep. For those of you who don't know, apparently Aberdeen News ran an article about Northern State University's Common Read program, where freshmen all read the same book in the fall of their first semester. Um, apparently a quote from that article said that a graduate student claims that Sarah Dessen is fine for teen girls, but definitely not up to the level of the Common Read, uh, where she states she became involved in their um, council so to speak, in order to stop them from choosing Sarah Dessen books. Quite scandalous. And then Sarah Dessen then took to Twitter with a screenshot of the interview saying she was hurt by what was said and that she hopes this made the student happy. Oi. It caused a Twitter storm of support for Sarah Dessen from some other authors, uh, but really quickly turned into a 
bit of a nightmare as the student was chased off social media completely. Um, the student also stated that the quote was taken out of context and that she didn't say it to be mean. And since then, both sides have apologized for their role in hurt feelings, as well as several authors who supported Dessen through some rather harsh words. Uh, but it seems everything has died down for now. And this just kind of goes to show to be very careful what you say and write because others are always listening. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember when I first saw it, I just saw it as like people talking about how much they love Sarah Dessen books. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And then I, yeah. um, saw everything that was going on. And I was like, this is much more complicated than it I first thought. <laughs> yes, and it, it brings up quite, it, it's very controversial on both sides. So it's, it brings up a lot of arguments um, yeah. either way. And it's, it's drastic as Jennifer says over there from all mm -hmm. angles. So yeah, some news. <laughs> yeah. Um, and if you want to know about more about it, probably just Google Sarah Dessen Twitter because there are a ton of articles that have been written about it. Um, yeah. But I'm not going to link any because I don't. Some of a lot of them are are really um, biased one way or the other. So feel free to read around. <laughs> yeah, form your own opinions on everything and make yourself educated. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Also. Every author needs a private chat that they can vent in. <laughs> yes, it is necessary. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, every stage of the publishing journey, writing, not agented, agented, whatever it may be, it's necessary. <laughs> um, Cal is here. Cal has been here for a lot of the episodes, if not all of them. So welcome back. Hello. Hey. <laughs> um, okay, so Publishers Weekly released their publishing industry salary survey, uh, and uh, here are a couple of the key points. Um, so it's funny, this is called like the salary survey, but it's 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 like the demographic survey as well. Um, the pay gap between men and women closed by seven thousand dollars in two thousand eighteen, but that's because men's median compensation <laughs> declined while women stayed steady. <laughs> okay. So, okay. <laughs> um, 2017 was the first year women held a greater share of management jobs than men at 59%, but that fell to 52% in 2018. 80% of all respondents were women. So we know that publishing tends to be very, there's a lot of women in publishing, but also the management tends to be skewed more towards men. But um, yeah. yeah, so we'll see what happens next year. Hopefully it doesn't fall further. Yeah. Um, the media pay raise last year, the median, sorry, the median pay raise last year was 2.7%. Um, and 20% said they received no raise in 2018. By the way, inflation in 2018 was 2.44%. So raises were actually lower, or just, just above, sorry, inflation. On, hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But to me, the major takeaway is that 84% of the publishing workforce is white, <laughs> um, which is not really a surprise, but is pretty disappointing. Only 2% were black and 3% Hispanic. That's their word, not mine. I just wanted to point that out. Um, and job satisfaction and time in their positions were also lower for people who weren't white. Yeah been a lot of changes in the industry recently too and I think a little bit of those changes you can see reflected in the salary changes as well um, yeah. I've seen so many editors moving over to agenting jobs and the fact that there were agent salaries on there surprised me in the first place because most agents don't actually get a salary yeah so yeah yeah really interesting article really interesting <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch more information in the article too. So if you're interested in seeing more about it, um, make sure you come back. It's going to be in in the, um, the description after the episode is over. I don't have them ahead of time. Um, Ebony said, that's so sad, 2%. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I great. always say, if you're involved in the publishing industry, it's good to be as knowledgeable as humanly possible. So reading up on all the salary, where the money's going, any kind of business related stuff is great to know going into publishing, going into, you know, agenting, editing, writing, whatever it may be, you want to know as much about where the money is actually going as you can. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Yeah. Speaking of that. (laughs) Yeah. So in related news, um, (laughs) there's now an anonymous book money spreadsheet going around where you can see the real salaries of, oh, wait, whoa, wait, no. I'm right. The real salaries of almost 300 so far publishing employees, including publicists, editors, agents, and more. So talk about where agents actually have their salaries. The link to both view the spreadsheet and submit your own salary will be in this description later tonight. So it's super interesting and talking about where money is going. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Yeah. So I think, I think this is really important information to have out there because I think a lot of people don't realize how relatively low publishing salaries are. Um, Especially considering most of these people live in New York City where the average rent for a one-bedroom apartment is $3,000 a month. Yeah. Most of the entry-level jobs that you see for even editors at some of the top editing houses like Harper and Simon & Schuster, you're looking at thirty to 40,000, which in New York is ridiculous to me. <laughs> I, how do you live off of that? And I yeah. think the, the biggest answer to that is that you don't, um, which is really sad for a lot of publishing professionals. So yeah. 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 It's not fun. Well, I, um, I don't want to say enjoyed. Enjoyed is probably the wrong word, but I, um, <laughs> I found value in scrolling through that spreadsheet. So hopefully you'll mm-hmm. check it out later tonight. Um, The Writer Beware blog has reported a troubling issue where people who do not have the rights to books are listing them on ACX to be produced. So if you don't know what ACX is, that's Audible site where authors can self-publish their own audiobooks or small presses as well um, by hiring a narrator. In one instance, the narrator was told to purchase the ebook from Amazon to read from. Cool. Yeah. So that's another, that's the publishing scam of the week, I guess. We've been talking about publishing scams. Um, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I mean, luckily so far, ACX has been kind of responsive when they're contacted, Mm -hmm. but most authors probably wouldn't even know if this was happening, you know? Yeah. No. And that's, it's really, it's just one of those things like you really need to be aware. And if you don't know the Writer Beware blog, I highly suggest you kind of start like searching around on it, do some research. Um, they really give some great, uh, what do I want to say, red flags. Um, um, that's for, so funny. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid of, so I'd call that a red flag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they give some really great like red flags for writers, um, especially because it's really hard to get inside information when you are a writer, especially if you're not agented or you're not published yet and things like that. And they're a really great resource for catching those red flags and making sure that you know what you're getting into as you're getting into this business. So Yeah, I subscribe to them by email. So, Oh, yeah. Ooh. You get all the <laughs> candles in your email every lunchtime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And as always, so moving on, the Book Industry Charitable Foundation, also known as BINC, and that's spelled B-I-N-C, not K, uh, provides financial assistance to bookstore employees in need, which yay. (laughs) Um, They released a survey of 696 people and found that 22% of them said they could have used financial assistance in the past two years. So they said it has been their busiest year providing financial assistance to 73 bookstore employees and their families by way of 1,050, or sorry, 155,000, I'm horrible with numbers, (laughs) in personal grants. So $155,000 has gone Mm -hmm. to 73 bookstore employees in the last couple, or the last year, I should say, which is really awesome. I, we need more grants like this. We need more money going to places that desperately need it because we all know we don't get paid enough. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's uplifting that there's an organization like this and it's, I think they've been helping a lot of people, but it's also, it's like when you see the Kickstarters for like cancer yeah. treatment, like we shouldn't need this, you know, they should be able to make um, a living wage, but yeah, it's book selling, especially is a really tough industry right now. So I'm glad that Bink exists at least to kind of bridge some of that gap. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they're doing a lot of good in the, our world. So all the more power to them. Abby and Ebony asked, what's that blog again? We were talking about writers beware. 
Um, it's, it's our the writer beware blog is what it's called. Um, but we will have, I'll have the link later tonight down below to Ebony if you want to come back. And so I'll link directly to it. Uh, but it's, it's like a blog spot. So it's like, it's not an easy <laughs> URL to give you. Yeah. And it kind of like, you have to search for certain specific things on writer mm -hmm. beware. Um, so there's, there's, it's, it can be a little bit confusing. Um, but if you know how to manage it and know how to search it, you can actually get a lot of really good information from it. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, despite Simon Schuster's sales being down, Oh, Jennifer said she posted it above. So cool. Ooh, thanks. Yay, thanks. <laughs> oh yeah. We can't, if I see if someone replies to a comment for some reason, I can't see it on here. So, mm. um, but if that's what happened, that's why. <laughs> um, so despite Simon Schuster's sales being down 9.6% or $23 million last quarter compared to a year ago, their profit rose by a million dollars. They're attributing the earnings bump to cost controls, improving efficiency of the supply chain and a lower cost of goods. Um, they released Bob Woodward's fear in the third quarter last year, which we all know is like a phenomenon. So that accounts for a lot of the revenue decline. Um, which I guess, I don't, I guess it's good if they're trying, if they're finding a way to run more efficiently, right? Yeah, it, it honestly just kind of blows my mind that 9.6% of their sales means $23 million. <laughs> How yeah. much, like, that blows my mind. So times that number by 10 and you have, like, I'm not that's a math sales. <laughs> Like, that's, that's an insane <laughs> amount of sales, and I will never see a portion of that money in my life, like most of us. Um, and that's blowing my mind. But yeah, I mean, if they're finding a way to be more efficient and more productive, um, all the more power to them. You know what I mean? We need publishing industry and publishing professionals that are willing to adapt to a more modern style of publishing. And a lot of our, I guess, like more uh, long term publishers. So a lot of our big five, um, some of our mid sized publishers and things like that, that have been around for a while. Um, are a little less willing to change and adapt to modern times, but we're finding kind of a turnover in publishing, which is really exciting. And they're kind of uh, finding their way to adapting to modern times, adapting to modern publishing, finding new ways to sell things, uh, which I think is kind of what you're seeing here. So, yeah, yeah, that's fun. <laughs> so in, well, not great news because it's Amazon. But Amazon has been reportedly cutting book orders to publishers over the last several weeks, ordering fewer books than usual due to space issues in its warehouses this holiday season. One member of the Independent Book Publishers Association reported that its sales to Amazon are down 50% compared to last year. And as a result, Amazon has been running out of inventory of books, even on the publication days, which can, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have actually seen that on Twitter where a couple of people couldn't even order books the first day they came out um, or pre-order them because of the fact that they've been running out of inventory. Third-party realtor retailers, wow, have been <laughs> taking advantage and several IBPA members have purchased their own supposedly new books and received used copies, stripped books and ARCs. That's ARC is advanced reader copies. I say them weird. I know there's no mechanism in place to police these sellers other than customers reporting they didn't get a new product. However, in the past few days, publishers have been seeing those orders return to normal numbers. So hopefully Amazon is getting themselves in business again. And I don't know, maybe doing something that's not quite so shady. <laughs> Be nice. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, and I mean, because a lot of these independent publishers, they don't have that bookstore distribution. So Amazon is is one of their their major sources of retail space. So yeah, and when they don't provide it, what are you going to do? <sighs> so and that's a whole other argument for another time on oh, numbers. That could be, yeah. <laughs> that's a whole other argument. So it could we'll be a whole about series that. of episodes. <laughs> Oh, man. 
Yeah. All right, earlier this week, Harper Collins, this is some good news. Yay. Yay. You gotta, you gotta celebrate when you get publishing good news, right? Um, Harper Collins announced it's launching Heart Drum, a native focused imprint to be headed up by author Cynthia Leadich Smith and Rosemary Brosnan, uh, vice president and editorial director at Harper Collins Children's Books. And those two have worked together for over 20 years. Um, and if you read the article, you see Cynthia actually brought the idea to Rosemary, um, which is just, and apparently she was like really enthusiastic about it. So that sounds great. Makes me so happy. I've been looking for native voices for so long. <laughs> I, I, you know, we just, we need more diverse stories. We need more diverse people in publishing. We need all voices to be heard. Um, so that's super great news. And in addition to that, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt announced that they're launching a new imprint called Etch. So E-T-C-H within its books for young readers group. It, the new Etch imprint will be publishing graphic novels that in their own words, not mine, um, <laughs> exemplify the best in art and storytelling across genres and reflect the diversity of young readers. They'll start with publishing seven graphic novels beginning in September, 2020 and move up to 15 per year after that. And in order to keep up with their diversity promise, editors from all of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt's existing children imprints will be able to acquire for Etch, which is super nice to see in publishing because usually uh, a lot of editors are limited to what they can acquire and what imprints they can acquire for. So this is really nice to see some new imprints and some new voices coming around. Yeah. And it's, it's nice to see the publishing industry embrace graphic novels as well. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I've, I, <laughs> as a teacher, I love them. They've been like a saving grace before, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, I just, I, I do not have that talent. <laughs> I'm not an artist by any means. I wish I was, but I'm so happy that they're finally kind of coming around and a lot of publishers are really embracing it. So. Jennifer's excited about it. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> All right, so the 70th annual National Book Award ceremony was held Wednesday night. LeVar Burton was the MC for the evening. It's always um, been a personal goal of mine to make it to one of these I would really like to attend. But um, let's see, who are the winners? The winners were in fiction, Susan Choi's Trust Exercise, in nonfiction, Sarah M. Broom's The Yellow House in poetry, author Z's Sightlines in translated literature, Baron Wankham's Homecoming. I'm going to pronounce all of these words wrong by Laszlo Krasnohorkai and translator Otili Molzit. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and Young People's Literature. How can I forget that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Martin W. Sandler's 1919, The Year That Changed America. I haven't read that one, but I, I'm sure as well as many other people are going to be checking it out soon. So Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations to all of them. Definitely. Oh, my goodness. And over a week ago, speaking of, you know, winners and sales and all sorts of things, Barnes and Noble's teen and sci-fi and fantasy blogs let go of all of their freelancers. Hmm. Some of you may have seen all of this blowing up on Twitter a little bit, saying that they were let go from their jobs. And of these freelancers includes Dahlia Adler. Adler. I can't talk today. Dahlia Adler, who was just on our last episode. So they said that they would be turning to booksellers for content and that the blogs will be run internally. So it's really a shame because... Uh, I honestly think they lost a lot of really, really great voices there. And that might not have been the best choice, but yeah. <sighs> what are you going to do? What are yeah, you both do? of those blogs were doing a lot to like really promote, not just like the big, you know, bestsellers either. Like they did a great, great job of like showcasing some of the lesser known books. And yeah. um, so it was really sad uh, yeah. to see that happen, especially after the, news the the week before from bustle that let go yeah uh, their book people um Lots but then they, so they said they're turning to booksellers for content and i mean that's that would be fine if i had any faith that the booksellers would be paid more yeah for that work but i don't <laughs> i know it's kind of a hope that maybe they're taking that money and putting it towards you know 
the booksellers themselves, but uh, there's just so much money being shuffled around in publishing and so many people moving and who knows where it all actually goes at this yeah. point. So sad to see all of them leave, you know, the blog. And I think we're all kind of standing behind them and rooting for them and hoping that they find another place to fall for their passion and their love of books. So, yeah. yeah. Well, finally, we have some positive book journalism news. <laughs> Medium is expanding their books team with three new senior editors focusing on business books, tech book coverage, and personal development book coverage. Um, I haven't really read any book content from Medium. I didn't even realize they had like structured book coverage. So I'm going to have to check that out. Yeah, that's as a teacher, um, like coming from a teacher perspective, it's really interesting to see um, more like industrial and educational like book imprints coming, um, especially because I don't represent them myself. Right. <laughs> I had enough of them in my past career. I don't want them now. But I'm like, there's a lot of people that can benefit from them and actually like nonfiction and um, more kind of what I want to say, like business books and things like that are taking off yeah. um so i'm really happy to see them expanding and hopefully kind of finding a nice like niche in the book industry i'm like you know the more sales the more books the more money we all hopefully are happy so jennifer <laughs> says medium <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so medium medium's kind of weird thing it's like a uh, a blog platform but then it's also monetized like if your articles are are popular enough you become monetized um but i guess they have like also content that they create and for in you know themselves so i haven't got too involved with medium <laughs> i haven't either so I guess I'm like, you can probably find a whole lot more information by Googling. I'm not sure we are the best, <laughs> the best resources for information for that. But, um, you know, the more sales. Awesome. Awesome. But yeah. Oh, AP says anyone can monetize. So I guess if you're on Medium, you can monetize your, your content. Oh. Okay. okay. All right. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and in some semi-sad news, uh, Mysterious Galaxy, which is a much-loved bookstore in San Diego for any of you who live around there, um, might close soon if they can't find a new owner and a new location. They've been looking for a new owner for over a year and have been month-to-month -month on their lease, and the building owner has found a new tenant to take a long-term lease on the space. So the store hosts about 20 events each month, so this will be a big loss to the community if they have to go. So, you know, if you're looking to buy a bookstore and become a bookstore owner and you're in the San Diego area or feel like moving there, you might <laughs> want to uh, monopolize that situation and see what you can do to kind of get your hand in there and maybe get some money going and save a bookstore. It'd be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, every, I mean, I, so many people just love that bookstore. So mm -hmm. it's, that's yeah, weird. there's been a lot of like tweets going around about it and things like that. And you can definitely Google. There's some stories and some interviews that make it kind of really sad. So, yeah, someone yeah. save it. <laughs> if anyone listening has enough money to buy a <laughs> <fantasy> bookstore. <laughs> That's hilarious. Anyone with money in publishing is decent yeah. and hilarious. Well, Simon Schuster apparently got some money, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's true. All right, so the, the last piece of news we have is, is a little bit older news, but it pops back up on the radar um, due to a plea deal that happened this week. And so I don't know if y'all heard about this when it happened, but earlier this year, former Baltimore Mayor Catherine Pugh made headlines because she had self-published a children's book series, and then organizations looking to secure contracts with the city bought large orders of those books with orders exceeding the number of books actually printed by 200%. Um, so basically they bought books that were never printed in order to gain political favor. Um, yeah, <laughs> she pled guilty to four of 11 counts, including fraud and tax evasion, um, but she won't be sentenced until February. I think the maximum sentence she's looking at is nine and a half years. Oh. 
So it's like one of those things that's like tangentially related to books. Um, but I guess you could do this with kind of any product, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's just really terrible that someone would use children books to do this. Children's books. I know. It, it, like it, the thing is that most of us in children's are here because we're passionate about what we do and we love kids, you know, and we want to teach them what we learn through life and we want to be there to support them. Um, so it's really kind of sad to see her monopolize that and, you yeah. know, committing fraud. Don't commit fraud, guys. <laughs> People will come after you. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, I mean, you think it's not that hard not to commit fraud, but I guess it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah just be a good person i guess and um yeah it is decently ridiculous but i don't know just be a good person and unfortunately like the book industry is the book industry and it's both fortunate and unfortunate at times as seen by our news today both good and bad so, yeah yeah that is so shady <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember hearing about this back when it first initially broke and, and I was just like, why? Why are you going to do this? <laughs> this is actually like my, if I'm thinking of the right one, I've heard of it before, but I didn't go too in detail. So this is my first time like seeing it on here. It was my first time actually like reading about it. And I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> It's like, this is really intense. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I was reading the article for about the plea deal and there was like even more than what I had thought when had heard of yeah. before I was like this is a lot like it's a whole a whole conspiracy it's like a whole thing yeah um, I, I definitely yeah. recommend like if you if you are fascinated by these things like I am checking out the article and I post it later tonight yeah yeah. Um, all right. So it is time to bring on Yay. our special guest. Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, our special guest today is Michael Morisi, and he is a best-selling comics author and novelist. His debut novel, Black Star Renegades, a space adventure in the spirit of Star Wars, was released in 2018 and dubbed one of the best sci-fi novels of the year by the Chicago Review of Books and The Verge. In comics, Maurice is the creator of numerous original series and has written and collaborated on multiple established properties, including Star Wars, Archie, Batman, Nightwing, Superman, Conan the Barbarian, and Hack Slash. Um, and Michael is having some technical difficulties, so we are going to have a picture of him instead of his wonderful face. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Michael. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Thanks for uh, thanks for bearing with me with many technical difficulties. As you can tell, I'm a writer, and <laughs> <laughs> not <nice> me. <laughs> Well, I'm glad so, you could come on the show. I'm glad you're here. Oh no, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much, and thanks thanks for being so so flexible and patient. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I knew that we could do this with his picture because Caitlin Johnson. I think you know her. Um, she, her. yeah, she came on a, a post pit mad live show with me, but she just didn't want to be on camera. So <laughs> <laughs> this is my clever way of getting there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's how I do it. Just, just, just claim, claim, uh, I have no idea what I'm doing. And <laughs> you know. There you go. This is my after conference look. I was at a <laughs> Philadelphia writing workshop and I was like, well, I guess I'll just keep my makeup and my hair done. <laughs> For now. <laughs> so that's how that worked. You got me on here. <laughs> so, oh my goodness. Should we start the questions? Yeah. Maybe? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's dig in. Michael, yeah. are you ready? Yeah. Oh yeah, always. Yeah, totally. <laughs> All right. Well, Michael, you write both long form novels and comics. Um, so how is the writing process for those different and how is it the same? Um well, I guess they're the same. I'll start there. Like they're the same. Um, and it's funny. I wonder, cause I, I got involved with the show through, we got introduced to it through Alex Segura, who is um, a good friend of mine and uh, my boss. I love Alex <laughs> um, and with, with Archie, uh, but he like me writes out uh, comics and, and books. And I, we've talked about this before. And I think one of the fundamental things that like uh, carries over between both and, um, 
this could probably be said across a, a number of mediums is that like there's some fundam fundamentals of storytelling that's always going to be uh, uh, transferable between you know books, comics, film. It's you know when you're talking about straight up just uh, essential narrative. We're not talking about experimental stuff or, or things like that, but like three act structure, uh, character development. There's certain things that are just intrinsic to you know capital S story, yeah. and they that exists in comics, it exists in movies, exists in books. Um, that doesn't mean it's like easy. <laughs> I think I'm still learning. We're all still learning. Uh, but you know, those are like the kind of building blocks that you want to be there. Um, yeah. The big difference, like for me is like when you're writing a comic script a comic script is kind of like a like 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 an instruction manual like you're really just conveying and it's an art form to itself because you're like conveying in the simplest way possible how to do something really complex uh and and that that relationship obviously between yourself and your artist evolves uh over time uh, and there's like different relationships between different writers and different artists but, like you're really just trying to like lay down like here is the page here is what's happening in these panels this is the action this is like fundamentally this is what's happening and not adding too much uh the novels to me like tries to like you know add uh too many things and uh and i understand like it gets confusing you know because if you're giving too much like for an artist to read the artist is trying to pull out an essential action an essential action and emotion and that action and emotion is going to go on this panel and then this action and emotion is going to go on that panel and, and so on and so forth so the more that you kind of like add on to that 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 core of like the action and emotion of that scene the more it kind of obfuscates that core um so you're just trying to like really really simple simply display this is what's happening um obviously then with a book it's much different because you are uh, you don't have, you can't use art, you know, as your crutch <laughs> uh, to tell that, you know, action and emotion and, and character and all that stuff. Um, so you are including all those things that you, you know, exercise from, from a comic book script. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting. Like it's cool. It's both have like really cool parts. Both have, you know, kind of drawbacks in terms of like as a novel, like you're fully artistically engaged uh with a script it's a lot simpler but like you also don't get that artistic engagement so um it's nice to be able to scratch both itches uh to do something really really kind of uh, stripped down and then do something that's really more robust uh, but they are definitely definitely different in, in key ways yeah i relate to that <clears> on <throat> such a personal level as an english teacher writing pitches is the hardest thing for me i hate it <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And yeah. I'm really glad you brought up the three act structure. That's what I use all the time when I do like synopsis workshops and like plotting workshops. I'm like, go to the three act structure. It's so important. It'll help you pick out everything. So Oh, I I, I, I like pound that and like I teach and do <laughs> workshops and stuff. It's just mm -hmm. such a good way to like you know, as they say, you know, rules are meant to be broken, you know, and you have to know the rules in order to break them. And like I find so many people uh, don't really know that really, really fundamental basic. I mean, they know, but they don't. You, you know, we all kind of know and like mm -hmm. that kind of yeah. subconscious. We've seen so many films and read so many books that we know without knowing. Yeah. But like once you become like really aware of it and can control it in a way, like it just frees you of so many choices that are almost made for you by knowing you don't have to guess what comes next. You kind of know what's supposed to come next. And that doesn't mean, you know, you, that can also kind of produce a kind of malaise, but like, you know, you want to still be able to surprise yourself, but like, it's so nice to be able to like know it and either mm -hmm. follow it or know it and consciously, you know, upset it in some way. And it's just, it's such a good tool to have to, to be able to, to draw on that a, a, as a nice, as a nice weight, as a nice guide, if yeah. nothing else. Yeah, and you use it in both like your long form novels and your comics, um, and it's important for like pretty much every writer to use. Like structure is a good thing until you know the rules in order to break them. Um, but as a follow up question, um, do you prefer comics over long form novels or long form novels over comics? Do you have a preference? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> impossible <me>. question. <laughs> no, no, no. I actually do. I actually do. I can pretty. Uh, 
as much as I love them both, the process of writing a novel is so much more satisfying um, because like, you know, like you go off like comics, there's two things about comics is one is that, like I said, like artistically, you're not as engaged as you are with a comic comic. You're just kind of like, you know, panel one, Luke grabs his lightsaber and turns it on. Like, that's not really that big, like, you know, like, <laughs> like, uh, um, so it's not really thrilling to write. It's really, when you see it, you're like, oh, wow, that's really great. You know, Luke's turning on his lightsaber and that's really awesome. But like writing it, mm, <laughs> you know, leaves, leaves a little bit to be desired, you know? Um, and also like comics are so compartmentalized that like you're writing in the, these serialized chunks um, and often comic writers like my like myself or like Alex or so many people are juggling so many you know writing three to four books at a time three or four you know comic books at a time that like mm -hmm. you don't feel as um, continuously uh, connected to what you're working on sometimes um, because like yeah. you have these breaks and you're doing one book then another book then you're back to book one then you're book doing book three and mm -hmm. you know etc um, so it's hard to keep uh, continuity. Uh, it's hard to keep that connection. Whereas like when I'm writing a novel, like that's the only novel I'm writing and I'm writing it from start to finish. There's no like monthly breaks. There's no like anything. Uh, you sit down for X amount of time and write this thing from beginning, middle and end. And uh, there's something really kind of cool and satisfying about that as opposed to like the kind of like breaking things up and then things happening these staggering stagger chunks like they are in comics yeah i was laughing as you're explaining this because sarah's drinking out of her wonder woman cup I am. <laughs> <laughs> all, all of my cups nice. are like that. yeah wow. um. <laughs> <laughs> all right you went oh yeah speaking of you went through the dc comics writers program right I did, yes, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. That Can was. You... Uh... <laughs> oh no, said, go ahead, sorry. sorry. Ebony said, "I love that cup." <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I've used it before on the show, but um, can you tell us a little bit about the program and your experience with it? Yeah, yeah, it was. Um... I think it was three years ago now, I believe. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, it had to because it was right when I went like full time um, freelance, um, which was a over three years ago. Um, and it was this program, and I don't know if they run it anymore, to be honest. Uh, I know they ran it a few times. I was like the uh, part of the pilot program, I was the first one. And basically, what it did was it took a lot of writers, uh, what is there, eight of us, I believe um who were picked actually i don't know how they picked us but um, <laughs> um they were picked uh, based on some criteria um from different genres and different mediums you know i was doing some co some comic and some you know and book stuff there was other people like uh like hannah khan who is a children's author and she's uh wonderful and she was in there uh, there was some like Matthew Rosenberg, who's now uh, a Marvel uh, exclusive writer. Uh, uh, so he's strictly com a comic book guy. There's just like a lot of different uh, diversity of, of people and backgrounds and, and, and genres and mediums and stuff like that. Um, so, and, and what the class was designed to do, uh, it was taught by Scott Snyder, who is a longtime DC uh, uh stable uh, a writer who wrote batman forever um um and amongst other things he's he's absolutely terrific and um what the course was designed to do was teach specifically like how to write superhero comics because um you know there's a definitely a specific uh narrative uh and tradition and language that mm -hmm. that goes to speaking in to superhero to superhero genre and it's difficult you know even for me i'd written comics for another year for a number of years and like it was difficult to kind of plunge into telling these larger and like larger than life stories that also had you know 50 to 70 maybe not 70 but like 60 years of history behind them and carrying that tradition while also trying to uh evolve that tradition at the same time um so there's a lot that goes into um writing in that genre and um yeah, I mean, I learned a ton. I mean, Scott is 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 among the best of the best. Uh, he was a great teacher, and it was really 
you know, targeted on learning how to tell these stories. And uh, it was a blast. I mean, I, I, I came out of it writing um, a number of characters. I just finished um, Shelf. And uh, I really wasn't ostensibly writing for DC uh, because I stopped writing issues, but I was writing a, 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 a graphic novel. So, um, and you guys probably know about this, this YA uh, line they used to call ink. And then they abandoned that mm -hmm. really fast <laughs> for some reason. Um, uh, but I wrote uh, a, a Dick Grayson, a Nightwing graphic novel that's coming out in May, maybe uh, something like that. Uh, so yeah, so it was it was definitely it was an eye opening experience, a, a really great learning experience, and being surrounded by uh, great writers and great people was was pretty fantastic. Yeah, cool. it sounds like a really awesome opportunity. Um, and since then, like you've written for a lot of great properties like Star Wars and Superman, right? Um, yeah. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I write, you... I write a lot of Star Wars right now. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. I'm sure like a lot <laughs> of everyone right who's listening is like, <laughs> <laughs> everyone who's listening right now is like, I'm watching Mandalorian. This is great. <laughs> um, but like, I'll do you have... <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> do you have like, or, like i guess which would be the world that you were like kind of most excited to join or do you have a preference for any of them uh, oh yeah i mean n no uh no disrespect to any other world <laughs> but uh, of course, uh of course. <laughs> Yes. Star Wars is where my X-wing is parked for life. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, it's my it, it's Star Wars. Is my favorite thing in the world. I, I have Star Wars tattoos. I, I am like I am all in with Star Wars, and um, I, I that's that's something I've been chasing after for a long, long time, <laughs> and nice. uh, it's finally it's finally starting to happen. So yeah, no, it's great. I I. I I'm thrilled to be to be working in that world, and especially writing like kids, kids Star Wars comics that like my kids can read, and uh, uh, that that I see kids uh, enjoying and being able to embrace. Um, I just wrote like a kids a kids uh, a Ray story, which is like I, I just can't get over how how much fun and awesome that is. And uh, yeah, it's it's I couldn't ask for I literally could not ask for more. That's yeah. amazing. Nice. Um. So you also write about Star Wars at StarWars.com and all kinds of media at Tor.com. And I think a lot of writers who go full-time writer, they they do these kind of gigs to like supplement their income. Um, how do you think that kind of work ties into the rest of your career? Like I write for a book news website and I know that it's kind of changed the way that I read. So have you noticed anything like that? Yeah, I mean, I think that like, what's good about that what's really great about it is that like it keeps you um engaged in the community which i think is really important i think that like staying um staying close uh to i don't want to say fan communities because it's more than that it is fan communities but it's more than just fan communities it's just like it's the publishing community it's the bookseller community it's the everything community that that kind of funnels through all these different um different channels of of your work itself um these websites um and er and everything that kind of goes along with that like what that work does like being able to like stay in touch like writing about star wars while i do write like you know the comics and and other things that i'm working on like um in in the fiction capacity like being able to still write about it like keeps that kind of freshness and love and passion alive because you don't that's where it all starts you know is like being you know you do these things because and you pursue these things because you, you love them so much and i love sci-fi so much uh and i you know had read tour.com and i still read tour.com for you know been reading for years and starwars.com so like um, it's a community that I was always, always a part of and still a part of. And like, I think it's still important to, to engage with it on some level, um, to stay connected to the community, but also to still maintain, um, you know, cause working in these places, like it can be a grind. It really, really can be a grind. Like as, as wonderful it is 
and is thrilling and as anybody will tell you like it can be just wearing on you because it's exhausting there's a lot that goes into working and as well there should be working on you know these these you know billion dollar properties you know um so it, it can be a lot you know so to maintain that foothold and like why you love it in the first place and it is because you just simply love to talk about it because you love to like if if you weren't writing comics or novels or whatever you'd still be talking about star wars or you'd still be talking about robert jordan or you'd still be talking about whomever um just because that's what you're compelled to do there's no reason to stop doing that uh just because you kind of like transition to a an, an additional role within the community um and i still love being able to do both Nice. Yeah, that's really awesome. And speaking of what you write about, in May, Vault Comics announced that you had signed a multi-project multimedia deal. So, and I know there's some things that you can't say, but can you, tell us, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about that and what we can expect to see coming out of it in the next few years? Yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was something, um, that, yeah. Um, so, so far what has come out of that deal? So I wrote, uh, I started writing a new series called the plot, which is a horror series. Um, I, I helped, uh, I collaborated on adapting my own series, uh, a sci-fi series called waste of space to a graphic audio adaptation. Um, I worked, uh, I wrote a collaboration with, uh, Blind Squirrel, a video game company, a, a video game that's coming out next year. Um, so that was like the stuff that was like in the works that kind of like threaded that deal together. And then um, it's going to be quiet for a bit because the next thing that we're working on is really, really uh, robust, I can say. Uh, it's, the, it's the biggest undertaking that I think I've no, definitely that I've ever done. <laughs> um, so we're going to be doing that. And then we have some other um, uh, multimedia stuff going on. That's kind of like, as those things tend to do, just taking a while. And we're kind of like gun, uh, just shy about announcing things because we vault is very good about this. And uh, we share the same mind of like a lot of stuff gets announced and then it's like, just disappears in the ether um and we don't really like to like put anything out unless it's like a real thing you know we don't like kind of false hype and that's why like when we announced the wasted space you know graphic uh audio adaptation that was already like almost done <laughs> um so like the deal was done the adaptation was done the same thing with video game like i i had I had finished the video game a few months before that so like we want to make sure that like everything uh, and vault is like this as well, just in general, like, like I said, like everything's concrete. Um, so yeah, so I'll, I'll be finishing, uh, I have 10 issues left to write of wasted space, finishing the plot. Uh, and I collaborate with, uh, Gary Dauberman on the series called a um, mall. Gary Dauberman's the screenwriter of, uh, it, uh, he's writing Salem's lot right now. Uh, work uh i don't know if i can say that anyway um <laughs> sorry. Uh, and uh yeah so uh you know we had that that was part of it as well and now so yeah so now it's like the bigger undertaking finish wasted space and then a few other things that were just kind of waiting to be securely real before we say anything about them Understood. so it's exciting I, I love those guys like the um um the vault guys are are, are uh, they're brothers, uh, Adrian and Damien, are some of the nicest, yeah. kindest, most generous, thoughtful people that I've ever come across in entertainment and in publishing or anything. Uh, they're, they're champions of putting out the best books, champion of putting out diverse books, champion of putting out uh, books for all ages. And they're just, um, they're very, very quiet about what they do and how they do it. And they let their actions and, and what they do speak for themselves. Um, and they're just, uh, they're, they're, they're a dream to, to be able to work with. That's awesome. Ebony yeah. is also very excited to hear all of this. <laughs> oh, I didn't say I got to try. Oh, <laughs> Salem's Lot. <laughs> yes. That's my favorite book of all time. And, uh, Gary and I have talked about it uh, extensively. Um, and, uh, from what I understand his, his adaptation is going to be fantastic. He, he did a, I mean, obviously he did a great job with it. That turned out. Okay. And, um, <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised though. He told me that a Salem's lot is is harder to adapt, which mm. I I, did, I was uh, I was surprised. It is about nine thousand pages long. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, do it. <laughs> someone brought in the book uh, to the library the other day, and I was like, "Wait, what? <laughs> Why is that book so big? <laughs> <laughs> so big." It's uh, and it's funny because I have I have a friend who's like a really close friend who's a bookseller who, um, it's like becomes this like gateway book or like at least parents want it to be a gateway book because the movie is about the movie is about kids you know mm -hmm. so like they think like oh it's about kids and they'll read it and they think it's like a kid's horror book. And there is the, still the kid's part, but like it's weaved in the book in such a haphazard way. And the book is, I mean, it's really, really long. I don't know. That's the a book you give to a 14 year old, <laughs> you know, like, um, so when you see it and you realize like how just massive of an undertaking this thing is, it's, it's, it's pretty daunting. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. Would not be me as a 14 year old. I was reading <laughs> Shakespeare though. So if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do, it's funny because I, I do like look at it. I'm like, oh, I wouldn't do it. I read it, I think I was 12 or 13 when I read it. Yeah. Uh, nearly, nearly killed me, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big scaredy cat, so I um, have not read it. It's, um, it's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, I have no. <laughs> I'm comfortable not reading it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I love horror, but I'd much rather watch it in all honesty so that I'm not horrified for a solid like, you know, week. Like oh, movies yeah. will give me, you know, like movies, anything like that will give me like horror for, you know, a couple hours and I'll get over yeah. it. But right. last forever. <laughs> Yeah. So. Yeah. Especially books that like take you like two months to read. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> those stick around. <laughs> Evan, you said, me too, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jennifer said, there will be none of that. <laughs> um, all right. So, Michael, I've seen you talk a lot in a couple of places about writers needing to do the work to put in the work. Um, and aside from re writing and reading, which are obviously like the two biggest things, what what resources or activity do you recommend to improve craft? Yeah, uh, uh, that's a great question. Um, and it's funny, like I, I, when I talk about that, um, I think the biggest thing um, that I try to count, I'm not a big believer in, in talent, you know? I don't believe there's like some mystical thing to writing. There's not a mystical thing to being an electrician. There's not a mystical thing to being, you know, my father was a truck driver. There's nothing really uh, uh, supernatural about any of these things. <laughs> you know, um, I think that like, it's just, uh, it's a craft, you know, writing is a craft. And like we were talking about at, at the beginning of the interview, we were talking about um, the react structure. I think falling back, one of the things I always recommend um, when I either talk about this or teach this is writing, or I'm sorry, reading uh, screenwriting books. And the reason I recommend that is because even if you don't want to be a screenwriter, like I've read um, so many books on writing from like William Gass and, 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 and Lamont uh, uh, to whomever, um, and they're all wonderful, but like the great value of screenwriting is that it kind of just says, it gives that kind of clockmaker's um, look at writing of like, here's the pieces of writing. Here's how they go together to make a, a kind of math formula of how a story functions. And you can take these pieces and you can put them together in different ways, or you can take pieces out and put different pieces in, whatever. But like knowing, like we we're saying, like knowing that math, knowing that formula, knowing that basic structure frees you in so many ways to break it, follow it, whatever. And I think that like, once you do that, you're able to just fundamentally do the work so much easier because you can sit down and say, um, okay, like I am writing this story. I'm writing this novel, this comic, whatever. And you can follow, you, ad you can adhere to the structure and you can at least say like, okay, my, my, my heroes, my characters are at this point. So according to the structure, you know, I'm at the end of the second act. So they have to hit their low point sometime. They have to hit their lowest point at some point soon. So I have to drive them to that point. And even if you don't stick to that, 
even if you write that part and then you go back and you say, you know what? No, I want to do it this way. I want to change it. I want to, I want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, undermine that structure. I want to undermine my own story, whatever, in this fun and creative ways. Like you're at least still doing something. The worst thing that can happen is doing nothing, you know, is sitting down, doing nothing. There's nothing more discouraging. There's nothing more disheartening. And that will prevent you from coming back tomorrow and coming back the next day and the next day. So as long as you're doing something, as long as you're progressing in some way and then can go back and figure out how to better what you've done, you're, you're in a great place. Um, and that's why I say just to like, to, to rely on those fundamentals at the very least, it'll keep you going and nothing is better than momentum is con continuous momentum keeps you kind of going from one place, one step to the next. And then you can always go back. You can always go back and change things and improve and, and develop and experiment and whatever. And that stuff is totally, you know, your first drafts are going to be wretched. <laughs> I can <laughs> promise you. <laughs> um, like they are guaranteed to be terrible and that's, they're supposed to be, that's what, you know, that's, that's part of the process, but it's getting to that trap and keeping going because uh, discouragement is, is a killer. And I, and I hate to see people discouraged. I hate people stop because they feel like they don't know where to go or what to do and don't believe that they can get to that next stop. Yeah. As a teacher, like years ago, some of the best advice I gave my kids was like, you can't edit a blank page. Ooh, that's great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you can edit, you can make better whatever is on the page, but you have to like throw up words on the page in order to kind mm -hmm. of like get yourself yeah. there. Yeah. I love that advice. I think your yeah. advice is great. No, um, I love that. You can't edit a blank page. Is, uh, I, I'm going to write that down. It's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure I got that from like a movie somewhere. So don't quote me. <laughs> yeah, I saw somewhere it was attributed to Jodi Picoult, but I don't yeah. know if she was like the original person who said it or not. Yeah. Uh, someone somewhere said it and it is not my words, but I just. I just <laughs> they, they are now. <laughs> <laughs> they are <laughs> Cal no. said save the cat is great. I use, yeah. I use the Save yeah. the Cat Beat Sheet, um, especially for romance. It's like perfect for romance. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And speaking of advice, so what advice like do you have specifically for novel and short story writers who might want to make the leap into comics? Don't. <laughs> 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 um, no, I think... Uh, it's so crazy, you know, because like everywhere I go, uh, and I think you should, I should, I'm just kidding. But like, it's funny because like the, the best advice, um, and I forgot where I heard this, but it was a, a writer, director, something like this, who uh, was saying how like in a perfect world, he used this analogy. It's not, it's not great, but it works. In a perfect world, if you're a freelancer, if you're, if you're an actor, director, whatever, writer, in a perfect world, you'd have one you have a pool and your pool is like your your life your finances whatever and you have one giant hose just pouring into that pool and that's what we all want you know like i'm a novelist and all my money just comes from novels and this is what i do and this is how i make my money that like so rarely happens like never like if you're like joe hill or <laughs> like something like you know brandon sanderson or jody picole like you know like something like that yeah yeah totally <laughs> other the rest of us like you have a hundred small hoses filling up your pool and it's writing for tour.com or starwars.com it's teaching it's writing short stories writing comics like i have friends uh i i'm I, i'm good friends and i'm like kind of like um we're kind of both mentoring each other back and forth. Uh, Dan Krause and Mike Cole, who are both novelists mm -hmm. who are working on their first comics. And, you know, I've been kind of like shepherding them through the process in a way as they've been helping me through other things. But like they found it like essential. They're like, oh man, not only they love comics, but they like, I have to do this. I have to diversify. I have to do other things because I just can't write enough books and I can't write enough comics which is not necessarily the only reason I started writing novels. That's a whole like different story, but like it's important to like do a lot of different things because it keeps flexing different muscles and keeps you fresh. It keeps you invigorated, but also just fundamentally keeps you paying 
for life, <laughs> you know? Um, but like, <clears throat> like the advice of like people who want to do it is one is that I think it's important to do. I think it's important to keep your perspective broad, you know, to keep your prospects broad, to like do different things and don't be afraid to do different things. Teach a class, you know, like teach, take a class, you know, uh, uh, write short stories, write novels, like write for different websites, like do all that sort of stuff uh, because one, it keeps you fresh, it keeps you invigorated and engaged, but also like you never know what comes out of that. And it's just good to have different channels. Um, I remember when I was a freelance journalist, like years and years ago, and I wrote basically for one place. And that place paid me great, and it was a dream. And then that place closed, and I was absolutely screwed. <laughs> like, and it was uh, like I was just my whole career was done. Like they closed on like a Friday, and like that weekend, I was like, "Well, that's over. <laughs> like time to do something else." And because uh, I had no fallback, I wasn't doing anything else. But um, but for people who fundamentally who want to make the jump from like if they're writing graph, you know, novels, and they want to move to comics. I think the big thing is like, I don't want to like, uh, uh, you know, continuously go on the story thing, but I think, again, like understanding story really, really, you know, kind of like grappling with the fun of those, those basic building blocks of story, but also like, it's so broad. I, and I, like I said, I talking to different people in addition to Dan and Mike, it's like comics is super broad. And I think that like, it's more than writing comics. It's like, what kind of comics do you want to write? Your comics, there's, there's a robust YA uh, graphic novel market. Uh, there are, you know, manga, there are uh, indie comics. There's, there's so many different things. So it's about like really, really understanding comics and the comics market. There's no better gift that you can give yourself than to, to um, thoroughly understand what you're getting into when it gets into <laughs> publishing. Yeah because um, you can get lost really fast. Um, and there's a lot to know and being prepared for uh, anything that can come and, and being armed with the knowledge community that I'm, that I'm engaging with and really kind of like knowing, okay, I'm writing YA graphic novels. Like what does that world look like? What does the YA graphic novel world look like? And you like really thoroughly understand that before jumping in seeing you know, ensuring that like you really are writing. Cause like I've seen proposals working with different places that are like, my YA graphic novel. And you're like, Ooh, like this is not a YA graphic novel, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, so like really thoroughly knowing what you're getting into and making sure that you're, you're pointing your kind of trajectory into the right place, you know, uh, is really, really important, you know, really know, what you're getting into before you get too deeply into it and make sure you're kind of like putting yourself where, where your work needs to, where you want to be and where your work needs to be is really important. Cause I see a lot of like misguided, like think that they're writing something for a certain uh, genre or medium or age group. And it's really not. And like that, like kind of like get, get you a bad place then. Cause then you're like, don't know where you belong. So um, yeah, just knowing those building blocks of story, knowing where your story is supposed to go and where it belongs is really important. And it helps save a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, like effort uh, of redis you know, having to rediscover it rather than know it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. We had even talked about this, not necessarily this, but, um, just like knowing the business <laughs> and doing the research and knowing where the money is going and things like that during our news portion, not that long ago. So yeah. Really important to do research, guys. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it so is. Like, it's the same thing, like, when you're finding an agent and you're like, I'm just going to email all the agents. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, I get the impulse, but also no. <laughs> yeah. You, <know>? yeah. <laughs> you got to find someone who's a good fit, you know, who's actually, like, actively looking for what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, right, tough. Well, uh -huh. it's tough. It's <laughs> tough. Yeah. Um, Michael, I have one final question for you before um, we let you go. It's a, a question that I ask all of my guests, <coughs> and anyone I ever interview. Um, and so I'm just going to, I try to give a warning, but I didn't give you a warning this time. But <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the most important book you've ever read and why? Oh, <laughs> that's the sound everyone makes when I ask this question. 
<laughs> like it's not just your favorite. It's your most important. No pressure. Oh, you know what? For a second, I was like, oh, I don't know, because a few things popped to mind. But I know my, okay, I know my most important. This, this I shouldn't have even hesitated. Um, the most important book uh, is easily Heir to the Empire by Timothy Zahn. Um, now, while it was not, it's often confused as the first Star Wars novel. It's not. Uh, it was, There was like uh, a, 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 not too many, but a few that preceded it. But it was the first one that continued after Return of the Jedi. And more importantly than that, I never knew any of those. There was like a bunch of Han Solo, Solo, Han Solo, Solo adventures <laughs> uh, written by Brian Daly that were excellent um, and a few other things. But like, I remember, I'll never forget being in, and this is this will date us properly, uh, being in Walden Books <laughs> um, and um, seeing this display of these these hardcover books. I have my hardcovers. I'm like, you, like you guys can't see me, but I can see myself looking at <laughs> my Timothy Zahn hardcover that I still have, and it blew my mind. I was like, oh my god, Star Wars are books now. Like, and like, it changed changed my world. It changed because I never, I knew I would never be like, even it like, because that came out in ninety. Two, I believe. I think I was twelve, um, and even at the time, I knew I was never going to be in California making movies and stuff like that. Even though Star Wars was my favorite thing, I was like, "Oh, this is this solves all my problems right here. I can just write Star Wars books." The end. <laughs> like, <laughs> and <laughs> um, and uh, they're they're such great stories. I mean, Zahn is um, is an absolute legend uh in, in the star wars universe and rightfully so he's one of the best star wars storytellers and a wonderful human being and um yeah i mean it's so important to me because it just opened up a world of possibilities that like for the first time in my life uh from the age of 12 till now it was like it made me feel like i can actually do this you know like oh like this is actually a possibility like i can actually pursue this dream like this like you know like just some like poor kid from the south side of chicago you know like looking at this book uh that thank thank goodness my mom was generous enough to buy for me um that has shaped me for like the last you know almost 30 years and um yeah there's there's little that's that's had a profound impact on on what's possible and what can be done than, than seeing that book in a bookstore. And uh, it's great. And I think that's like so great. I mean, when you guys were talking about the news, you're talking about um, native storytelling. That's what gets me so excited about, you know, more diverse publishers and more diverse publishing. Like that feeling I had when I was 12 years old, open up the doors that like I can, do this, you know, this is a thing that's possible. And there's nothing more powerful than telling somebody that this is possible, like this can actually happen. And that is, uh, uh, there's fewer greater gifts that you can give to somebody, uh, especially an aspiring artist, which you know, being an artist, writer, whatever is difficult enough. Uh, and being able to empower somebody to say, hey, this person did it and so can you, uh, it, it is pretty wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, Ebony said, I love that groan. <laughs> You're right, Sarah. Everyone does it. Um, <coughs> yeah. Uh, so I've met Timothy Zahn a couple of oh, times. Oh, Alexander says, I see it's 1991. Oh, okay. Oof, I was, That's close. It's very possible. Close. <laughs> uh, yeah, I met Timothy Zahn several times. He goes to a con that I go to a lot in Florida. And uh, I was on a panel with him, actually. I was like, this is intimidating. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's funny. My So... This, this con, it's called Necronomicon. It's like a very small science fiction fantasy literature focused con in Tampa. And um, my sister <coughs> was like, she was like a late, late blossoming nerd. You know, like she used to make fun of me and, and now she's like really into Doctor Who and everything. And uh, <laughs> she, she came to this con with me. It was her first ever con. And um, Timothy Zahn turned and was like, oh, I like your shirt. And she's like, thanks. And we walked away. I was like, do you have any clue who that is? She's like, no. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she was just like, ah, oh, you like my shirt? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll follow that up. Even, um, go ahead. No, 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 please, please, please go. Uh, I was just going to say, it's like I 
a couple months ago, I was at the same conference as Angie Thomas, and I legitimately could not even look at her because I was like, "This is not okay." I was like, "Oh gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into like fangirl mode, and it was gonna be really embarrassing." I was like, "I'm gonna embarrass myself." I was like, "I can't even. I'm, I'm just going to look the other way," and I felt so awkward. I didn't even know what to do. I was like, I felt like I went back to being, you know, the like. 15 year old reader with my nose in a book that didn't even know how to talk to people, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny how you, how quickly you can be reduced, <laughs> mm-hmm. which happens to me all the time, you know, like, yeah, it's, um, it's crazy. The power that the, you know, that, that like these stories have, you know, and the storytellers that have, um, but I was, I, I was actually a follow up, um, where the briefs are like a sad <laughs> story. <laughs> Cause like I, there is a, in Muncie, which is, you know, not far from here um, in Chicago, there was, um, it was just, they were having a, uh, this comic shop that I'm friendly with having a star Wars day. Uh, and Timothy Zahn was there and they're like, we want you and Timothy Zahn. And they knew uh, Christy, the owner who is uh, such a wonderful person. She's like, I know how much you love him and we're going to bring you out. We're going to sit you guys together and you'll have all day with Timothy Zahn. <laughs> like cause my um uh graphic novel my my trade of my star wars stuff just it just came out I'm like we're gonna do this thing up and it was like literally like oh my god this is my dream literally come true um i got so sick so sick like and i think it was like my body being like you just can't do it you can't handle it I'm like that's it we have to we just have to like physically revolt i got so sick and i didn't go i couldn't i couldn't make it i was like i it's like it was like a three-hour drive and my wife's like, I'll drive you. I was like, I can't, I cannot make it. Like, I just, I couldn't be in a car for three hours and sign and be like super ill next to Timothy Zahn. I was like, no, no. Yeah. Uh, so no, I, 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 I didn't end up going. And it, it breaks. It, this is like three months ago. Oh. The wound is still, sorry. still <laughs> very fresh. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, like, um, you know, I've met, like, I've met him, like, as a, just, like, in a signing line, and he signed my books, and it's, you know, mm-hmm. but, yeah. well, like, like you said, like, I would be, like, the whole time, like, instead of enjoying sitting next to Timothy Zahn, I would just probably be, like, sweating and, <laughs> and like, crying to myself, <laughs> <laughs> so it was probably my body telling me, like, no, man, this is, this is a bad idea. <laughs> when I was, like, so an itty bitty blogger like before I was even an intern or anything like that I had an anxiety attack in front of one of my favorite authors and I still to this day <laughs> cannot go to any of her events because I'm so embarrassed by oh no <laughs> I'm like, sure I have, like, a meltdown Fine. like crying oh I I'm pretty sure I like I might have like well, let's say I left some giant tear marks on her shirt because she tried to comfort me. Okay. And there <laughs> might have been a little bit like I, I just like it was it was full blown <laughs> tears and I needed a tissue and <laughs> to say the least. Mm. It's embarrassing. And it's funny how we all like we all get reduced to that at some point in our lives where it's yeah. just like, Oh yeah. I don't um, I don't like react too much, but like so that con that I was talking about my sister came to, she came because Christopher Paulini was a guest of honor and like she read his books as a teen and and she really wanted to meet him. And I was on a world building panel with him and I was like, okay. And he was like super respectful. Like he made sure everyone got talking time, you know, cause obviously like everyone in the room was there to see him and not me. Um, but I, when I met Tamora Pierce, I like lost, oh. lost my oh, cool a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> not bad, yeah, but like, be... yeah, I definitely cried. <laughs> That that would be a hard person to meet. <laughs> um, yeah. Like she's she's a giant. That's no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we're running a little long, but I, we're having oh, fun. So no, it's <laughs> fine. Um, but thank you, Michael, so much for joining us tonight. We have a couple more things before um, that me and Kelly are going <laughs> to do to close out the show. But we'll let you go. And um, thank you so much for joining us. Oh no, no! Thank you for having me. This is this is a blast. I'm thrilled to have been yeah. here, and, and and good to good to be talking to you guys. Thank you. So I'm waving. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can um, feel it. It's because I was waving. waving <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> cosmic wave um, so but yes thank you this is this is wonderful and I, i'm really grateful to have been here and, and had a blast thank you yeah and you can find uh his website and his social media stuff in the description down below and um thank you michael have a good night thank you, you guys too take care
Me too. Bye. <laughs> All right. Oh, Kendra said omens, oh, more Pierce. I can't <laughs> imagine. I'd be a mess. Yeah, she was at the giant signing at RT. Oh. And I walked by and I was like, what is she? okay? And I like I hate getting books at RT because you have to wait in line forever, you know? Yeah. And I was like, well, I'm getting it. I don't care. <laughs> like, I'm not not getting books signed by Tamara Pierce, you know? She had like three people in line. Like, it was crazy. That was um, it? She only had three people in line? Yeah. Well, think about it's RT, right? Oh. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, people don't know what they're missing. I don't know. I'm one of those crossover agents. So I do both like, you know, romance and like young adult and children's. And I'm like, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I love both. I don't understand <laughs> what people do. <laughs> oh, man. Anyways. Yeah. All right. So um, the audiobook of the week is one that I read actually, I think last year I read, listened to. Yeah. Um, it's What the Eyes Don't See, a story of crisis, resistance, and hope in an American city by Mona Hanna Atisha. Um, this is from the publisher. What the Eyes Don't See is the inspiring story of how Dr. Mona, accompanied by an idiosyncratic team of researchers, and that is a very true statement, having read the book, parents, friends, and community leaders proved that Flint's kids were exposed to lead and then fought her own government and a brutal backlash to expose the truth to the world. Paced like a scientific thriller, the book shows how misguided austerity politics, the withdrawal of democratic government, and callous bureaucratic indifference place an entire city at risk. At the center of the story is Dr. Mona herself, an immigrant doctor, scientist, and mother whose family's activist roots inspired her pursuit of justice. Um, so I was offered a copy of the audiobook by a publisher last year, and I was just like so moved by the book. And I was for a couple of weeks, I was telling like, everyone about it. Um, and Dr. Mona actually narrates it herself too. Um, and, but it also just made me like really angry. Like I found myself just being angry for weeks about the whole situation, um, about everyone who failed the folks in Flint. Um, some of them through negligence and some of them were like actively trying to cover it up, you know? Yeah. Well, I and, think that's, we all try to make readers feel emotion. So I think it's awesome that you did feel. That. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, it was really great. Um, and also, like, I had seen, you know, stuff about Flint in the news, but, like, I didn't, I, I don't think I fully understood it until I listened to this book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, check it out. It's, it's, it's not a fun book, but it's a great book. <laughs> um, that way. Yeah. And it also, it talks about her, like, family's history. Like, she ties in some of those stories of, like, some of her, her family history, and it just ties in so well, and it's, it's wonderfully done. But, Aww. yeah. That's amazing. That sounds really awesome. We should all check it out. Um, all right. So was, let me check the comments real quick. Ebony said, that sounds good. I'm going to have to add that to my CBR list. Ebony says that. I think every <laughs> audio book I talk about. I'm pretty sure Ebony's CBR list is maybe just as long as the rest of ours. <laughs> like a couple years long, maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. Um, so do you consider yourself a plotter, pantser, or somewhere in between? Um I am a pantser. I, I use the beat sheet, but like, it's literally like at most 19 sentences, you know? Um, and that's more about timing than plot for me. Yeah. How about you? Do you well, know? when I was a writer, yeah, <laughs> I was definitely a pantser. And then I gave up after one chapter. So um. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm not meant to be a writer. I'm done. I'm done. I can't do it anymore. This is hard. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely probably more of a pantser, although <laughs> I tell all of my clients to do what works best for them. Yeah. Um, so they'll find their group mm -hmm. as will every single author and writer out there. I'm like, you just have to find what works best for you. Right. Yeah. Well, let's see what the poll said. Um, I'm going to take that little thing off. So let's see. Um, we have most most people, 47% of people are somewhere in between. <laughs> and yep. only, it looks like 18%. It's really, really small on my screen, so it's hard to see. 18, 19%. Yep, 18%. 18%, uh, 18 um, are pantsers, and the rest are plotters. So yeah. I guess I'm in the minority here, huh? <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. But, hey, whatever works for you. I mean, you're telling, you go. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I also, I remember, um, 
seeing a writer talk, I can't even remember who it was, and they were a plotter, and but they were like really prescriptive about it, like basically like you have to do it this way or you're you're not a writer. But then I saw an article from like Nora Roberts that said she was a pantser. I was like, well, if Nora Roberts can be a pantser, like, because <laughs> how many books does she put out? You know? Yeah, yeah, I know. So, so you have to do what's best for you, and once you find <laughs> the thing that works, you know stick with yeah. it and keep going and keep learning from it. I'm like, it's the best thing all of us can do because we're all individuals and we all do things very, very differently. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, all right. So we have our quote of the week. Quote of the week is a feature that I added because I like quotes and that's, that's really all there is to it. Um, but I have always imagined that paradise will be a kind of library. Jorge Luis Borges. Um, I work in a library and it's not paradise, but he said a kind of library. So maybe it's the beauty and the beast library. I mean, like I really love the library I work at. It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. But, um, yeah. but I, I don't, I wouldn't call it paradise, you know, yeah. but yeah. Oh, beauty, beauty and the beast. Huh? I mean, except for the part where you're taking hostage by a beast. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe without the beast, like maybe even just being alone, since you know most of us around here are kind of like introverts or like extroverted introverts. You know, like maybe we can just have the entire library to ourselves. <laughs> well, I'm an extrovert, so if I had, I would throw parties all the time if oh, I had go. the beast castle. So I would come to your party. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's like the. Yeah. The best thing you can say to an event planner slash extrovert. <laughs> there you go. I would definitely come to your party then, Sarah. <laughs> nice. I know. As long um, as I get to take home a book, right? That's like my party. Yeah. Book. Okay. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So um, that is pretty much all we have to, for today. Um, so thank you so much for joining me, Kelly. Of and, course. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, I mean, you're you're a great guest co-host so I really enjoyed you having on having Thanks. you on yeah. I told you I was chatty <laughs> well, good. I'm still a little worn down from the conference so this isn't <laughs> even me like 100% uh -oh. so I apologize in advance if you have me back so <laughs> oh, yes that would be that would be funny <laughs> oh, Jennifer says library party yes yeah. yes exactly <laughs> um oh, Ebony said my TBR list is so long <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks for your help on my query a few months back. It's great to see you somewhat in person. Oh, thanks. Aww. That's cool. Ebony, I'm so glad it's it's hopefully I will cross my fingers that it's working. I'm crossing my fingers for you. And uh -huh. you know, I always say like every time I'm like, oh, like rather than sending good thoughts or good juju, I'm always like, I will pray to the old gods and the new because <laughs> <laughs> I'm like involving all the gods. Every all god, of them. Everyone. Yeah. Um, but seriously, like sending some good juju and you know praying to the old gods and the new that things work out for you, Ebony. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, remove you from the screen, I guess. Okay. I need to find a better way to say that. A nicer way to say that. <laughs> um, while I do just kind of the outro stuff. And Sounds thank good. you so much, Kelly. Have a good of night. Of course. Great to be here. Bye. <laughs> All right. So if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss another episode. Also tell your friends. That is the best way to let people know about it, uh, about the show. Um, in the description, you'll find a link where you can subscribe via email. So you can get an email the day of every episode, just as an extra reminder. Um, and also the Patreon link is in the description. If you'd like to support the show with a couple of dollars a month, that would be much appreciated. It helps to pay for some of the equipment and the software and stuff that I use. Um, and the uh, website and the social media links and everything for tonight's guests is in the description along with Pub Talk Live social media links as well. So you can find all of that info below and all the links for the news articles that we talked about will be in the description in probably about two hours. I have to make dinner before I can do that because I am very hungry. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for watching. And I, oh, Tamara said, thanks. I got a lot of helpful info today. Great, great. Thank you for watching, Tamara. Um, so sorry, my dog, he was quiet the whole episode and now he's, okay. Um, yeah, you can hear the little, um, thank you guys so much for watching. I will see you next time. Have a good night.